Welcome to the tip channel. That is perfection. Today we're going to take a look at making a European frameless cabinet. What does that mean? Here in America, typical cabinets have always been made with a face frame on the cabinet, and that's the front of the cabinet that you see around the doors and drawer heads. Uh, over in Europe, they make cabinets frameless, and that just simply means that cabinet frame you see on the face of the cabinet, it's not there. What they do is they change to three quarter inch thick material. Now, Typically, you're going to find that a true European frameless cabinet is going to be constructed out of industrial board. Very similar to particle board, totally different composition as far as the size of the wood flake and also the glue that's used to manufacture the product. Uh, today, we'll be using two-sided melamine, so it's three-quarter inch thick melamine on two sides. Now, the reason for using the industrial board versus plywood is keeping in mind that we don't have a face frame on the cabinet. So the problem with plywood is you can have a tendency to warp with plywood. Naturally, with the American cabinet, it has the frame to stabilize that plywood. Uh, because we don't have a frameless, naturally, the industrial board is a much more stable product. So three quarter inch melamine, two sides for the cabinet box. We'll be doing a quarter inch melamine with an MDF core, just simply stands for medium density fiber core material as the core of the material. And it has the white melamine on two sides. For the doors, we'll be using three quarter inch Boise board, uh, which is actually made for doing countertops and doing any type of laminate work, very, very stable product. We'll be putting laminate on two sides of the door and also be doing some laminate edge bands. Um, for the drawer boxes, we again will be using the white melamine material. We'll be edge banding with a edge band material. Um, now, for the exterior of the cabinet box, naturally, we'll be using high pressure laminate. Now, high pressure laminate, uh, basically, people will refer to this as Formica a lot. Uh, for Mike is actually a, a brand name, but high pressure laminate is what we'll be using on the exterior of our cabinet. And actually, this is available in, in hundreds and hundreds of different colors. You can use a solid color if you want. You can also choose a wood grain. Now, this is a wood grain laminate. It's not a wood veneer. Now, if you'd like to have a wood cabinet using wood doors and what have you, you can also cover the cabinet in a real wood veneer. Uh, in our case, we'll be using the high pressure laminate. Now, this is the same type of construction that you will typically see in doctor's office, dentist offices, and hospitals. Uh, the reason being is that the melamine material for the interior of the cabinet does not harbor bacteria. Naturally, the high pressure laminate, again, does not harbor bacteria. Uh, whereas the wood will harbor bacteria. As far as cleaning the high pressure laminate, you can use spick and span, top job, soap powder. You can use gasoline on the outside of the cabinet. You don't have to worry about hurting it with any type of harsh chemical. We'll actually be using lacquer thinner today to clean off excess glue. Uh, the lacquer thinner is one of the strongest solvents that there are. It has no effect at all on the high pressure laminate. So let's get started. First, we need to cut out the parts for our cabinet. Now, when dealing with a table saw with a melamine product, you will find that you'll get some chipping on the bottom of the panel. Now, to eliminate a lot of that chipping, I suggest using a Royce Air triple chip blade. This is a blade specifically made to minimize the amount of chipping. Also, you want to keep your blade clean. After a while, you're going to get some pitch buildup and you're going to want to keep that removed. Also, if you take the time to, as you're cutting out your panels, mark the top of the board and you can, as you start to build your cabinets, position those pieces so that the top of your board is like the inside of your cabinet uh, so that your chips are on the outside where they're not really seen. Next up, we need to groove our parts for the back of the cabinet. Now, 
this saw I have set up running actually backwards. My blades are actually turning like this. I'm able to do that because I have a feeder on here. Without a feeder, you will need the blades to go in the correct direction. But because I'm running the saw backwards, if you will, it eliminates a lot of chipping. Now, I've got a set of Dadu blades in here. Dadu blades width is about 5 16 uh, because the material that we're using for the back is a quarter of an inch and then they apply the melamine to it so it ends up a little bit heavy. Uh, the depth that I have is a quarter of an inch high and I have the Thadu blade set approximately about a half inch off of the fence. That's what's referred to as a half inch standing shoulder. What that does is the material past that isn't just going to want to break off because we got the standing shoulder there. Um, so, daddy blades about five sixteenths of an inch width, a little over a quarter of an inch in height. Three. We're getting ready to cut our laminates for the job. Now, two ways to cut laminate. Number one is you can cut it on your table saw. And the second one is that you can use a slitter for small pieces, which I'll show you in just a bit. I'm gonna cut my big pieces out first. And uh, one little tip is this is just a scrap piece of quarter inch. I've melted a blocker to the end of it and put that right up against your fence. And actually what that will do is stop the laminate from going underneath of your fence. Also, if your laminate came to you rolled up, it might uh, have a tendency to curl up a little bit as you're starting to go through your saw. So naturally, you can just take a scrap piece and set on top of it so that it lays flat going through your saw. Now there's a couple more ways to work with laminate. Uh, I showed you the way naturally on the table saw. The second one is a paper cutter. Now, with a paper cutter, what you want to do is you want to keep your good piece up on the paper cutter. Put your piece in, square it up. Just that easy, you can cut it. You need to go a little further. Go against your cutting bar, bar and your cutting edge to line it back up and finish your cut. That's the second way. Third way is a slitter. Now, what is a slitter? A slitter is made to do small pieces of laminate. And you can see it has two cutting wheels on it. So that's where it actually cuts the laminate. And then there is a gauge which you can set at whatever width that you're looking for, and naturally you can cut the laminate accordingly. So basically the edge of the edge guide rides on the laminate, and you just simply go down the laminate piece. Now don't get excited if you go off a little bit, because you can take it right back over to your table saw again, straighten up the edge, and then continue slitting. Now, if I were doing an entire order of cabinets, I would have ordered a roll of edge banding material to match the laminate that I'm using, and I would have used the edge banding material. Edge banding material uh, comes in different widths, and you can get it either glued or non-glued. I use the non-glued because I'm using an edge bander, which puts a hot melt adhesive on it, uh, but you can get it in a pre-glued, uh, and you can actually take an iron and iron the piece into place. So one advantage of the edge banding uh, is you don't have to cut, you don't have to slit your pieces for your edge band. Now I am going to use my edge bander to put the edges on my cabinets and my doors and drawer heads. Uh, on my drawer boxes, I'll be using an edge banding material. Um, now, you can put edge bands on by hand, and I'll do a section of video uh, from another cabinet that I made to show how to hand band. How to apply edge bands by hand. What I use is Wilson Art, and uh, I use the Wilson Art 500. This is made to be brushable. You can get product from them that's made to be sprayed through a spray gun. 
Uh, they also make air canisters uh, that you can have with the glue in it. Uh, but I do like the Wilson R product. This is coming from a supplier. It's not coming from a lumber yard. Now, first of all, um, container. Uh, you want something that has a good plastic in. Some of this will eat the thinner plastic. So you end up with a bowl that starts to disintegrate. So a little thicker plastic. Uh, naturally, a throwaway brush. And uh, what you want to do is go ahead and uh, glue the edge band. And you want to glue the edge of the wood. Now, let me explain that the wood will have a tendency to suck up the glue. So what I normally do is I give it a coat, I let it dry for a little bit, and then I hit that a second coat. Um, now, we've got one here prepared. We'll go ahead and show you how to stick this. Now, as I mentioned, you got one shot. So what you want to do is to align it and then press it into place. Now, you can just use your hands, but it is nice to have a J-roller. J-roller applies a lot of pressure. I also have T-rollers when I'm working with bigger pieces, but that applies a lot of pressure. Now, at this point, you can see that I've got overhang here, I've got overhang here, overhang here. So what I'll do next is I'll take my router and router off that excess. Now, a few things in regards to doing your edge banding. First of all, if you're using the contact adhesive, what you want is that you want to wait until the glue is dry to the point where you can touch it with your finger and it doesn't come off. That's about five minutes or so. After that, you've got about a half an hour to 45 minutes to actually get the piece stuck into place. And what we're going to do is to router them off. I'm using a router bit with a bearing on it. And I've set the depth so I'm barely cutting through the edge band. Now, typically what I will do also, because you're looking at sort of trying to keep this straight on a very narrow piece, is I typically tip my router up just a little bit. So we'll go ahead and router that off. With the excess routed off, our next step is to use a file. Now, as I mentioned, you've got a coarse side, you've got a fine side. So I'll start out with the coarse, and I'll stay with the product. So in other words, first of all, you don't want to pull, you want to push. So we're going to push. I'm going to lay it flat on the surface, cut my excess off with that file, and then I'm going to switch to my smooth side. I'm going to go a little bit of an angle and just soften that corner off a little. Go ahead and hit my edges. Switch to the other side. Same thing. Now, at this point, you want to have a little bit of excess glue. Uh, and you take a little bit of lacquer thinner and a rag. And you can clean that right up. I'm getting ready to glue up my doors for this project. And I've only got a couple doors to do. Uh, if I were doing a big order, I would take an entire 4x8 sheet, glue it up, and then cut my door and drawer heads out to the exact size that I needed. Uh, in this case, we've only got a couple doors to do. So uh, what I've done is that I've oversized the door. And what I'm talking about is I went two inches bigger each way. I made my laminate two inches bigger each way. Then what I'm going to do is take it back to the saw and cut it down to the actual size. Now, the advantage to doing that is that I don't have to router, file, get all my edges cleaned up. Uh, because there'll be some glue running over the edges, things like that. The saw will take care of all of that, and I'll be ready to go into the bander. Now, today we're going to take a look at building a cat four-poster hammock bed. Just kidding. But isn't it amazing how much stuff they come up with for us to buy? And we buy it! Anyway, just finished filing all the edge bands on our cabinets. And I wanted to take a second to talk about fouling. And laminate is very durable, very chemical resistant. Uh, it is very scratch resistant. It's even fire resistant. But 
The weak link on working with laminate is filing. And what I'm talking about is whenever you're filing your product, you want to take your time and fill it with your fingers. See if you can catch it with your fingernails. If you can catch it with your fingernails, that's the weak spot of working with laminate. Someone can catch that very easily, either with a sweeper, with a broom, uh, somebody sliding something off of a desk. They catch that edge and they're pulling the laminate away from the substrate. That's where it will chip. So it is the wink leak. Nobody likes filing, but it's one of the most important parts of dealing with laminate. Now, two of the cabinets that we're building today are going to have adjustable shelves in. So naturally, we need to set up for adjustable shelving before we assemble our cabinets. Um, this is what's referred to as a line boring machine. Now, this will come down and drill 42 holes in the side of the cabinet all one shot. They do make this machine in a lot of different sizes. You don't have to invest into a machine like this. There's templates that they sell online that you can put on the board and just take your hand drill and drill them. Uh, that is one possibility. Uh, second thing is that you can use KV shelf standards and brackets. And I'll throw that up on the screen so that you understand what I'm talking about with those. And those, you would just take these standards, put them on the cabinet, and put screws into it. Now, we are going to be using a true European Blum hinge. And this has a back plate. And the back plate basically has two screws in it that goes right into our line boring. So what's very important is that that dimension off the front of the cabinet for that plate needs to be 37 millimeters, which translates to about one and seven sixteenths off of the front edge. So very important. Now, if you're doing all this by hand and you're worried about your hinges, Blum makes this little template and basically it's made to catch on the face of your cabinet and then it has two holes that you drill like an eighth of an inch hole just for placement. And that will give you your back plate for your hinges. So we'll go ahead and drill the sides of the cabinets. And I mark my tops and my bottoms so I know uh, which way to put it into the machine. We're now ready to start our assembly. And what I've done is that I have drilled four holes in the top and four holes in the bottom. Now, this is one of the cabinets with the removable toe kick. Uh, so I'm three eighths of an inch down. I come in about two inches from each side and then about a six inch spacing between screws. Now for drilling that, I use this drill bit. Now. It is really nice because first of all, it's got a point on so it doesn't travel all over the place. And it also has an area that does the recessing for the screw for you. Also, because it's coming out in a point, you don't get a lot of blowout on the opposite side of the melamine. So we'll have four assembly screws in the top and the bottom. So we'll go ahead and line things up. Now, first of all, glue. We want glue in there for the back panel. Any good cabinet person will tell you it's not the staples, it's not the nails, it's not the screws, it's the glue that holds the cabinet together. So here we are, we've got our cabinet side, cabinet top or bottom. Now what I'm concerned with is that I'd like to have the face of the cabinet as flush as possible. So I'll get that lined up. And first of all, I'll shoot an inch and a quarter staple. Now, what's nice about the staple is it's forgiving, meaning that if you're off just a hair, you can tap it and get everything just perfect before you put your screws. Naturally, after you put your screws in, you're, well, I think you sort of get my point. So we have our top and bottom screwed into place. The next thing we want to do is to go ahead and slide in our back panel. And 
And we'll take our other side. And we'll go ahead and attach it. Next thing we need to do is to square our cabinet. Uh, we'll take our rule and we'll measure from corner to corner. In our case, this is 32 and 3 16 Go the opposite corners. And again, I'm 32 and 3 16 So I know that my cabinet is square. If it was out a little bit, I'd bump it to get it back into square. Now that I have it square, I'm going to take a quarter inch crown, 18 gauge staple, half inch long, and I'm going to toenail all along the cabinet side. And our cabinet box is done other than our toe kick. And we'll show you that. We've got our cabinets assembled. Now we're ready to start running our laminate. So what we have is we have three finished sides here that need to be finished. Um, these two cabinets right here are going on an entertainment center. So they'll actually have a finished top on them as well. So I'm going to run my side laminate first and then do my top laminate. That way, if somebody's wiping off the top of the cabinet, they're not taking a chance of catching my side laminate and chipping it. Uh, so we'll do our side laminates first. To glue this on, I'll be using a Wilson Art 500. The Wilson Art 500 is a brushable adhesive. Um, I'll also be using a 9-inch roller. Nothing special about the roller. It's just a cheap throwaway, 3-8 uh, snap. And I have put the toe kick on this cabinet and covered it with laminate. So what I have right now is I have a raw edge right here. Uh, this is going to suck up my glue. So basically, I'm going to actually double glue that area right there. Now, the white melamine material, they do make in a two-sided and they make it in a one-sided. If you order the one-sided, it'll have melamine on the one side and then it'll have a phenolic backer sheet on the other. Now, I'm a small shop. I don't have room for a lot of inventory. I just order in the two-sided. What I do then is I take my belt sander with a 50 grit sand belt on it and I scuff that side of the melamine where I'm putting my laminate so that I'll get a real good adhesion. Now, in preparation, my laminate I cut two inches big in each direction. So I'll have a one inch overhang all the way around. Uh, then I'll take my router and router off the excess. Um, with the contact adhesive, what you do is you glue the cabinet and you glue the laminate. Now, it is contact adhesive, meaning that the minute that the two make contact, they're going to stick. So if you're a little afraid of sticking it and not getting it in the right position, you can use push sticks. Now, push sticks just basically are scrap pieces of uh, three-quarter material. And I'll lay a few of those down. What that does is it allows you to go ahead and put your sheet into position, not worrying about touching your cabinet. Get your one inch overhangs all the way around. And then naturally you can take your sticks out and stick your laminate. Now, you can just press this into place with your hands. That is a possibility. What I prefer is to use either a J roller or a T roller. This is a J roller made for the laminates. And I also have a T roller whenever I'm doing countertops. And you can get a whole lot more pressure with this than what you can with your hands. Now, what you want to be careful is not to roll off the edges because naturally you can bust the laminate. So we'll go ahead and J-roll this. We'll go ahead and stick our other pieces, and then we'll be ready to router this off. We have our laminate stuck, and now we're ready to router off the access. Now, I'll be using two different routers. 
Uh, this one first is a flush cut bit, and it's got a bearing at the end of it. Now, a little tip, keep some WD-40 on that bearing. It keeps it from getting locked up, from getting glue in it. Um, I'll go around the entire perimeter with this router. Whenever I come to this finished face, what I'll actually do is take and tilt it out just a little bit. So I'm not taking a chance of burning the uh, face laminate. Next up, after I get that done, I will take and use this router. And it has what's called a no file router bit in. And it's at a very slight angle. You adjust it just to the point where it cuts it perfectly and you barely even have to touch it with a file. Now, once I get that done, in this case, this cabinet has a countertop on. So I'm going to take my belt sander, go along that top edge, go along the back, go along the bottom, just to make sure we don't have any edges sticking past. So when we transport this and take it in the house, we're not going to have an issue with chipping a piece of laminate off the side of the cabinet. Now, when you get ready to hit this with your belt sander on the top, the back, and the bottom, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the belt on your belt sander is pushing down against the lamb that you don't want to pull up. So, naturally, I've got the bottom of my belt sander towards the floor. And I can clean up that edge just that easy. I've got no overhang, no chance of chipping. Now, the last thing to do with our finished side, I've routed off this face with the flush cut. I went back through and routed it again with the no file router, and now I'm ready to file it in. So, first of all, we need to be able to clean off the excess laminate glue, a little bit of lacquer thinner, and we're ready to file. Now, a laminate file has two edges it has a coarse and it has a fine. So, I'll start out with the coarse, and I'll go just about flush. Now, when you're fouling, you're always pushing towards the laminate. You never push back. And now I have it just about flush. And I want to soften that edge, so I'm going to flip over to my smooth side. And naturally check it to make sure I don't have any overhang. Clean off the excess glue. And we are done with this side. Next up, we're going to take a look at making the drawer boxes for the cabinets. Now, I'm going to be using the white melamine uh, again for the drawers. Um, I'm going to be using a side mount track, which takes one inch. Now, keeping in mind whenever you buy the melamine material, it's typically a three-quarter inch industrial board. And then they apply the melamine to the two sides of it. So it does run heavy. Uh, that having been said, whenever you figure your parts, figure an inch and a sixteenth for your drawer track, just to be on the safe side. Uh, that sixteenth of an inch will take up for the differences in the melamines. Now, I'll be using an inch and a half, 18 gauge Neller. Uh, and basically, this is very similar to what we had in regards to building cabinets. Um, so I'll line up my parts. And I will shoot four 18 gauge nails. To hold the sides together. After I get my front and back nailed into one of my sides, I'll go ahead and put my quarter inch bottom in. And put my last side on. Did I mention to put glue down into the grooves where the bottom goes in? Always using glue.
Okay, after our last side is now, now we need to square. And again, we can do the same as we did with the cabinets. Use a ruler, go side to side, or if it's a smaller drawer box, naturally we can use a framing square. And our box is square, so same as the cabinetry, we'll be using the half inch long, 18 gauge, quarter inch crown. We're building three cabinets here, one of which is going into a desk area. So it has a normal toe kick notch. Reason being, as you walk up to the desk and you start to work on a counter space, you have some place for your toes to get. So just like a kitchen cabinet, if you will. The other two is going into an entertainment center. So I want a little bit more of a furniture look with those. And uh, my reveal, I'm going to have a reveal a half inch back. Now it's always better to give it a little bit of a reveal, even if it's only an eighth of an inch. If you try to make something flush, you will always end up with a terrible looking seam. So even an eighth of an inch reveal will help. In my case, I've got a half inch reveal. Also, this particular cabinet's going against a wall. And the wall has a piece of baseboard and a piece of quarter round. This is furniture, so I don't want to cut out the baseboard and quarter round. So what I've done is I've left an inch and a half reveal on this toe kick area here. That'll allow for my base in my three quarter round. Now, this is just basically a four sided box. This is just basically a four sided box. And I've laminated the sides that needs to be finished. And I've attached four screw blocks. Now, these cabinets have to go up a circular staircase. So a little more difficult, if you will. Um, with the screw blocks in there, I'll actually attach this once I get it up into the site. I'm getting ready to attach our drawer track in our cabinet. Now, what I did was lay out my drawer head's height. And what I'm going to have is a file drawer at the bottom and then two six inch drawers. So I've marked out where my drawer heads are and I want a quarter inch above that uh, for the bottom of my track. Now what I've done is I've cut a couple scrap pieces and I'll put one in the front, one towards the back. And I'll take my drawer track, lay it into place. Go ahead and screw it down. And then I've done shorter blocks. That'll be for my next drawer track. And then naturally my bottom drawer my track will be right against the bottom. We have our drawer track in our cabinets. Now we're ready to attach the drawer track parts to the drawers. Um, the situation is that our drawer track is an inch and three quarters high. This runs in the center of that track. So basically we're looking at the center of the track would be an inch and three quarters divided by two, seven eighths of an inch. So what I did was I took my speed square and I put a pencil mark at seven eighths of an inch all along the drawer. And then I'll take my drawer track piece and attach that to the drawer side following on that line. Now I do like using a self-centering drill bit, it just keeps the screws from wobbling around. And what a self-centering drill bit is, is that it has a drill bit in the center of this. As you push down, the drill bit comes out. So this helps to keep the hole right in the center of the track. We're getting ready to set up our drawer heads on our drawer boxes. That's Wendell, he's helping. He said he's gonna be a movie star. Anyways, we've got our drawer into our cabinet. The one thing I did fail to mention is that the uh, bottom drawer track, instead of seven eighths to the center, it's five eighths to the center. That leaves me a quarter of an inch down at the bottom so my drawer box doesn't rub the bottom of the cabinet. So we'll take our drawer head and we'll get it lined up. And I've got that clamped into place. And I'll go ahead and shoot some inch and an eighth staples into the back. Just two, just temporary.
Now again, the staples are forgiving. So I'll look at it, make sure everything's all lined up perfectly. If I need to tap it a little bit at this time, I can. And we're perfect. So now I'll go ahead and shoot four inch and a quarter screws in from the back side into the drawer head. Uh, my second drawer, I have an eighth of an inch spacer. And I'll place that between the two drawer heads. Line that up with the bottom drawer head. And rinse and repeat. Now the top drawer is a little more challenging. Because as you can see, I can't get behind it with my staple gun to temporarily uh, tack it into place. Uh, now a good friend of mine builds his cabinets with about a six inch piece in the front and back of the cabinet which would be great for a drawer base because then you could get in and staple it. So what I'll need to do is I'll measure to the top of my drawer and then naturally deduct an eighth of an inch. I'll take my drawer box out, set it on my drawer head, staple it temporarily. Then I'll take it and put it into the cabinet and check it, see if I need to bump it any, and then zap my last two screws in. Next up, we're getting ready to hinge our doors. Um, now, this is, as I mentioned before, a Blum self-closing hinge, uh, cushion close. Everybody loves cushion close nowadays. Um, this is the plate that will go inside of the cabinet. Now, they do make these in different overlays. Overlays means how far the door overlays the cabinet. Uh, in my case, what I'm wanting is an eighth of an inch reveal all the way around. So I have a 5 8 overlap. Now, these will be, be available in either screw in or knock in. The difference is, is that knock in has a little raw plug on them. Uh, and likewise, so does the hinge. And with the knock in, basically the plates we're going to go right into our five millimeter boring that we did on our line boring machine uh, for our shells. The plate goes right into the line boring and simply screw it down. Next up, I need to mark the location of those two hinges. So I've got my reveal eighth of an inch top and bottom and I'll go ahead and mark the center of my hinges. This is a Blum European hinge drilling machine. And what this will do is come down and drill three holes in the door. They're gonna have one large one for the hinge itself and two for the raw plugs. Now, you don't have to invest into an expensive machine like this. They're making all types of templates nowadays for these European hinges. Uh, most of the time, what you're gonna find is you're just gonna be drilling this large hole, and then you'll just take and screw right into the board with the two small screws. Now the knock-in hinges means exactly that. You knock them in. Once you have your plates in your cabinets and your hinges on your door, simply line up your hinge. In the front, it locks in, and then you snap it down into place. Lock the front in, snap the back down, and the door's done, just that easy. Now, what is nice as well is that you can very easily remove the door. Right in back is a release clip. You pull up on it, and it releases and you can take the door off. Nice function. Cabins are all finished and we're ready to do the install. How did things turn out? This is the tip channel. That is perfection. What? It ain't cocky if you back it up. I hope you found the video informative. If you did, please like and subscribe and have a great day.